So we're going to begin this morning with a little quiz uh, called Name That Religious Figure. Okay, I'm going to describe an aspect of either the life of Jesus or the life of Buddha. And then I want you to see if you can determine which is which. So you ready? Ready or not, here we go. His birth was accompanied by miraculous signs. Was it Jesus? Was it Buddha? Or was it both? Maybe make a little mark, write it down to yourself, or you can do it in your own head. Next, he began his mission in his early 30s. Jesus, Buddha, or both? He called disciples to follow and learn from him. He challenged the hypocrisy of the popular religion of his day. After a last supper, he announced to his disciples that he was about to die. If you saw our theme, then you will know that each and every one of those statements was true about both of them. Every statement I made was true of both Jesus and Buddha. Now, though Buddha lived about 500 years before the time of Jesus, there's much about their teaching and their lives that are surprisingly similar, especially how it relates to how one cultivates their interior life, as well as how they are to conduct themselves in the world, their ethical behavior. I want you to listen to some of their teachings and see if you don't hear a great deal of similarity between the two. Buddha said, consider others as yourself. Jesus said, golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Buddha said, if anyone should give you a blow with his hand, with a stick, or with a knife, you should abandon any desires and utter any evil words. Jesus said, if anyone strikes you on the cheek, you are to offer them the other also. Buddha said, if you do not tend to one another, then who is there to tend to you? Whoever would tend to me, he should also tend to the sick. Jesus said, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Really, I could go on and on. There are many, many, many similarities between the teachings of Jesus, Jesus and Buddha. But before thinking that Jesus and Buddha are basically the same, which I don't think probably many of you will, but just in case you were tempted to go down that path, you also need to understand that there are some serious differences between the two that simply cannot be ignored, lest it be a grave insult and a disservice to both Jesus and Buddha. Now, if you've not been with us, we are in week three of a series called A World of Difference. And what we're trying to do is better understand our neighbors who see the world differently than we do so that we can learn how to love them better. Because Jesus taught us that central to our faith is the idea that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. But I submit to you that we simply cannot do this if we are ignorant of who our neighbors are, what they believe, and why they live the way that they do. And so last week we were looking at and learning about our Hindu neighbors. This week we will be taking a look at and learning about our Buddhist neighbors who, by the way, make up about 7% of the global population, which is roughly about a half a billion people on planet Earth. And so because they matter so deeply to God, it seems to me that they should also matter deeply to us. So I want to begin with a story. The story of Buddhism begins with a man by the name of Siddhartha Gautama. He is known to us as the Buddha. Now, we don't know exactly when he was born. Some people say he was born in 563 BC. 
but many others believe it was more likely around 480 BC. But whenever he was born, it was roughly about 500 years before the time of Jesus. He was born in Nepal as a prince to a wealthy tribal chief who ruled a small kingdom. Now, while giving birth to Siddhartha, his mother died in childbirth. And so consequently, his father did everything he could to protect his young son from every form of suffering as he grew up. He made sure that he was always surrounded by beautiful people and beautiful things. He wanted for nothing. At age 16, he married and had a son, and for the next decade, he lived his life in the lap of luxury with his family. But by the time he was about 29 years old, he was struggling with issues of his identity. He wanted to know his place in the world because his world had become very small. What he knew of God from the Hinduism of his day was of little to no help in receiving his questions and struggles. And so one day, he left the confines of his cozy palace in search of a world beyond his own sheltered experience. In doing so, he set out on three separate journeys and had three different experiences. Now, some Buddhists will tell you that his journeys are historical, and other Buddhists will say that they are more apocryphal. But either way, what I'm about to tell you is critical for your understanding of Buddhism. Now, on Siddhartha's first journey, he and his chariot driver went out and after traveling a little ways, they came across this decrepit old man. He was bent from age. His body was in bad shape. And as Siddhartha looked at him, he was deeply disturbed by what he saw. And so he asked his driver, is this the fate of all people? And the charioteer said to him, yes, all of us will one day grow old. Hearing this, it distressed Siddhartha so much that he had to go back to his palace. He didn't know what to do, he couldn't handle it. He'd never seen anything like this. Sometime after recovering from the experience, he went out again. And this time he encountered someone who was very ill. Again, he asked the driver, is this the fate of all people? And his charioteer said, yes, all people will suffer illness at some point in their lives. Again, he was so troubled that he went back to the safety of his palace to think about what he had seen. Sometime later, he ventured out, and one more time, he came across a funeral procession. The body was laid out for everyone to see. Siddhartha, in his entire life, had never seen a dead body. And he asked the driver, what is that? The charioteer told him, that is a dead body. And Siddhartha said, is that the fate of all people? And his driver said, yes, one day, every last one of us will experience death. Well, this was the final straw. He couldn't understand how to live with the burden of this reality. I mean, how are we to live knowing that the world is so transient, that nothing is permanent, that everyone will experience age, sickness, suffering, and even death? Of course, these are some of the questions that all of us have as we work through them over a period of time, but it was only in a roughly a very short period that Siddhartha was forced to confront all of these at once. And because of it, he experienced an existential crisis. His father saw his anxiety and he wanted to do something to help him. So he threw a huge party to chase away his son's despair but it didn't help him at all. In fact, it made things worse. He realized that no amount of material pleasure can take away our suffering. So since pleasure didn't do the job, he tried the opposite approach. He decided to renounce his life of wealth and power forever. One night when his wife and his son were asleep, he left his palace and he entered a monastery where he became a monk and he pursued a life of extreme asceticism. He fasted, and he decided to live on one grain of rice per day. Eventually, on the verge of starvation, 
he realized that self-denial was no more effective at relieving his angst than the pursuit of pleasure. And so, after six years of his life as a monk, at the age of 35, he sat down under a tree and he determined that he would not get up until he found the key to living without anxiety, turmoil, and suffering. He sat under the tree for 49 days until he fell into a deep trance. And in doing so, he came to see the world as he had never seen it before. Now, when he awoke, he believed that he understood the source of suffering and the path to overcome it. He had attained enlightenment. Siddhartha Gautama had become the Buddha, which simply means the enlightened one. And for the next 45 years, he shared his insights and experiences with others. Now, he never claimed to be God, nor did his disciples consider him to be one. As an enlightened teacher, his sole purpose was to free others from their suffering. After his death, the Buddha's teachings were passed down orally for about four to 500 years until the first collection was produced in 29 BC, which is called the Pali Canon. Now, that's the story of how Siddhartha Gautama became the enlightened one or the Buddha. What I wanna do now is give you insights the things that he discovered that he received while sitting under the tree, which are intended to help remove all pain and suffering from your life. Anybody interested for having all pain and suffering removed from your life? If so, listen to what Siddhartha discovered as he sat under the Bodhi tree for 49 days. These are called the Four Noble Truths. Truth number one, Suffering is an integral part of life. We all experience feelings of anxiety, pain, grief, and loss. This is what he would refer to as dukkha, feelings of suffering and pain. So the first noble truth is suffering is an integral part of life. Number two, the origin of our suffering comes from our desire. It comes from our attachment. It comes from clinging to things, clinging to others, clinging to possessions, clinging to life itself. So again, suffering is integral to our lives. The origin of suffering comes from desire. Noble truth number three, we can all overcome our suffering by extinguishing all desire. So Siddhartha thought that the way that we overcome our pain and suffering, our struggle and our strife is by to extinguish all desire. And you're like, well, cool. How do you do that, right? How do you extinguish desire? Do I want to extinguish desire? Is it bad? Is it good? Siddhartha would say that all, every form of attachment is bad that desire is not good and the way to relieve our suffering is to detach ourselves from anything that would cause it. Which leads us to the fourth noble truth. And that is that desire can be extinguished through the eightfold path. So he gives us a way in which to do it. Now these are eight practices that lead to detachment and result in enlightenment. The path is oftentimes, if you'll study Buddhism, you'll oftentimes see this path portrayed as a wheel with eight different spokes. And here are the eight practices that lead us to the ability to extinguish desire. Number one, right view, right view or right belief. Number two, right intention. Number three, right speech. Number four, right conduct. Number five, right livelihood or occupation. Number six, right effort. Number seven, 
right concentration. And number eight, right mindfulness. Now, when we share after uh, the time of my teaching, I can go over any and all of that for you. But for now, those are the eight practices that would lead us to the extinguishing of desire. If I were to give you a basic summary of the path, what I would say that we must is, is this, really. We have to do as much good as we can. We also have to refrain from doing evil and we have to purify our minds. We need to do as much good as we can to refrain from doing any form of evil and also to purify our minds. It's a grand oversimplification, but I'm just making the point to give you an idea as to what the Eightfold Path is about. Now, like we did with our Hindu neighbors, I want us to consider some questions that are pertinent for better understanding the faith of our Buddhist neighbors, okay? So, who is God and what is God like to the Buddhist? You need to know this. Buddhism is the only major religion that doesn't center on a belief in a supreme being or God. For Buddhists, God's existence is irrelevant for ending human suffering. When Siddhartha turned to Brahman to find answers, he found no help to relieve his angst. He said that whether one believes in God or not, it really doesn't matter because the path for ending, ending suffering does not depend on faith in God. So Buddhists are primarily agnostic because they don't attempt to draw people close to nor teach the will of any particular God. Also, they do not worship Buddha. He is not a divine figure. He is not a deity. They simply look to the Buddha as a guide, hoping to achieve the kind of enlightenment that he once did. Now, of course, as Christians, we embrace the idea of one supreme being, one glorious and transcendent God who revealed himself to us most clearly in the person of Jesus. In Jesus, we see a God who weeps over those who suffer, who is moved to compassion when he sees the sick and broken. Through his own suffering, death, and resurrection, he teaches us about what is impermanent and what is permanent. He teaches us about love by showing us that God has the final word over violence and pain and death. Through Jesus, we believe that we can find abundant life both now and in the age to come through the power of the resurrection. So Buddhism's view and Christianity's view of God differ greatly. Second, what is the nature of life? What is our goal for living? What is our ultimate destiny? Unlike both Hindus and Christians, Buddhists do not believe in the reality of a soul. They don't think that we possess a soul. They believe that our individual identity is just an illusion. There is no you. So there is no soul. There is no you. Every being, however, is subject to karma, which is energy created by both our good and our bad deeds, which eventually will determine the state that we occupy in the life to come. Now, the ultimate goal for a Buddhist is to be, re to be released from a cycling of suffering and death and rebirth and become one with all. The end of the cycle comes when you are able to release all clinging and desire and then become free. This state is called nirvana by both Buddhists and Hindus. But when they use this word, it means something very different. For Hindus, nirvana means the reunion of one's soul with God. You become one with Brahman. But for Buddhists, since there's no God and there's no soul, nirvana means that the karmic energy that makes up one's life force is extinguished and then released into the universe, becoming absorbed with all other energy. Now, I gave you the image last week that 
or becoming one with Brahman in its final state of nirvana, that a good Hindu would use the image of a drop of water being returned back to an ocean of water and becoming one with it. The image I would give you of a Buddhist and what nirvana is, is if you have a candle, when you blow that candle out and extinguish the light, that would be nirvana. You are then, with whatever energies that made you up, you are then dispersed back and you rejoin all of the rest of the energy of the universe. Now, obviously, Christians believe that while some attachment may cause suffering, that the largest cause of our suffering comes from sin. It comes when we stray from God's will for our lives, which brings the greatest amount of pain. But to deal with our suffering, the answer is not to detach from all people, places, and things. The answer to deal with our suffering comes through repentance, which requires a change of thinking. And ultimately, our change of thinking leads to a change of our action and our behavior. Repentance in and of itself is kind of a form of enlightenment. When we were headed in one direction and all of a sudden we realized that we have strayed from the path that God had laid out for us to follow, it's a coming to our senses. It's a realizing I'm going in the wrong direction and this is leading me away from God's best. And so in that moment, there is a confession on our part and then a turning to a different way. Perhaps accompanied with that, there is a making amends with God or with the one that you've hurt. But there ultimately, when we get this enlightenment, it ultimately re results in a change in our behavior, which opens the door then to reconciliation and right relationship with God and with one another. It takes away the suffering that we've inflicted upon each other, and it helps bring healing to our world. Jesus did not teach us that following him would eliminate all forms of suffering. In fact, he promised us that suffering would be very much a part of our lives. Instead, what he asked us to do was to embrace our suffering, was to take up our cross every day, and the cross is an instrument of death. Jesus' answer to suffering is that it will not have the final word, that we will experience it here on this earth. And there will be days where it feels like it's breaking us in two and that we will not survive. But what Jesus shows us with his life and death and resurrection is that suffering does not have the final word. That's why the Apostle Paul also tells us in Romans chapter 5 that because of our faith in Christ, one day we will be brought into a place of undeserved privilege where we can stand and confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing in God's glory. That is what the resurrection is all about. Unlike Buddhists, we embrace the notion that each of us have a soul. We do not believe that our lives are just an illusion. Even though our physical bodies are transitory and die, we believe that there is something more to us than just our physical bodies. And when our body dies, we will in fact receive a new body and inhabit a new place called paradise or heaven. We believe that when our earthly life ends, we are not extinguished like a candle or reabsorbed into the cosmos. We believe that just as Jesus rose from the dead, according to his promise, that we will too. For Jesus said, because I live, you will live also. And that is the hope of our faith. So, when you're listening to the teachings of the Buddha, and you're comparing them over and against the teachings of Jesus, I hope you will see that there are indeed some similarities but there are in fact some great differences. My deep hope for you this morning and in the days to come is that as you grow in understanding, as you grow in your learning, as you gain new insights, that it will give you an appreciation for how to love your Buddhist neighbors better. 
You can't love your neighbor if you don't know them. If you don't understand how it is that they see the world, if you don't understand what's going on in their minds and in their lives. And so I hope today we skim the surface, but that it will drive you to a deeper pursuit of understanding and loving more deeply your Buddhist neighbor. I also hope for you that you will deepen your understanding of what it means to be a Christian yourself. In our class on Thursday night, we were talking about the fact of what if there was a Hindu, or in this case, a Buddhist, who came to you and asked you those simple questions. What is God like? What is your purpose in the world? What is the nature of eternity? What brings about salvation in your life? How are you to deal with suffering? What if, what if a, a good Buddhist came and sat down with you? and ask you these questions. You and I should be able to answer these because these are not peripheral to our faith. These are central to who we are and what we believe and what we're about. So I hope that you're not only learning about your neighbor so that you could love them better, but I hope you're also learning about your own faith and deepening your own understanding so that your story will be clear as you share it with others. Whatever the case, it's my great hope and prayer that as we do these things, that it will make a world of difference for all of us. With that being said, let's pray together. Lord, we see that central to Buddhism is the issue of suffering. You can't get beyond a basic understanding without realizing the angst that occurs as one thinks about this reality in our lives and how it is that we're to deal with it. And I just ask you, as we think about the suffering that we endure, that we experience, how it is that we approach that, how it is that we think about it, because sometimes our suffering leads us into dark places and it creates distance between us and you, between us and ourselves, and between us and our neighbors. God, I pray that you would deepen our insights to help us deal with the difficult things in life in a way that is consistent with the faith that we have and hope to have in your son, Jesus Christ. So now as we process through some of our learnings, would you join us and guide us and grant us enlightenment as we seek to become the best possible versions of ourselves. And in doing so, may we honor you and may we be a blessing to our world. In Christ we pray, amen.